Yeah, you know, speaking of allergies, let's talk about movies in 1991. Tale as old as time, song as old as rhyme, movies in 91. That's what we're talking about, everybody. Yeah, so just our usual talk through of movies from 1991. Let's try and speed through. I saw this movie in the theater with my family. I remembered being sort of vaguely familiar with like Adam's family via like Nick at Night and like the song and stuff. It's a really fun family movie. And there's like a meme now about how like Morticia and Gomez like exemplify like the perfect marriage. (laughs) And it's what I aspire to. It's fun if you go back and watch it. Something that they do that I'm obsessed with is that every close-up scene of Morticia, they put a spotlight on her face so it looks like she's literally glowing in every picture. And I just want that for my life. (laughs) Well, yeah, it sort of is intentionally playing with a lot of those like noir film ideas and its style, not really its content, but also what a cast so with good. A- yes. Angelica Houston, of course, will make me see anything. Gorgeous. So um, great. Raul Julia, Christopher Lloyd, Christina Ricci. A young Christina Ricci. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, was that her first movie? But we already talked about Mermaids, which was, I think, probably her first movie. At least her first big one. This was the very last film that James Stewart was in. Uh, and he was the voice of the dog. And it has uh, Dom DeLuise and John Cleese. I don't remember the film as much, but the score to this film is yeah. fantastic. And yes. Tanya's song especially sort of was like a big inspiration to a lot of my early composition career. A lot of the like ways it uses mixture and stuff like that became like important parts of my style. Okay, I was obsessed with this movie. Like I saw both this and the original Five but this I had on VHS, I wore that tape out and i don't know if like watching it now i would enjoy it as much anymore like based on its own qualities or just based on the fact that it's so got so much nostalgia value for me but uh but the score is yeah excellent like i still remember the words to some of those songs oh, so the movie. lazy eye <laughs> I'm a good-looking spider, you know. There's lots of women who'd like to marry me. <laughs> I think it does hold up. Erica and I watched it a couple of years ago, and I still really enjoyed it. <laughs> yes. And Dreams to Dream is also a good example of that very 90s movie trope of, like, the Linda Ronstadt single or the Bette Midler single. Like, the like the big, breezy, soft rock ballad single of the movie. <laughs> Vanessa Williams and Peebo Bryson or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I feel like bring that back. They kind of do that anyway, but it's they don't get the radio play anymore. Because every film, even if it's a you know an old movie musical, has to have a new song so that it can be a right. player, an Oscar for a new, best new song. But, Speaking of new songs, yes. So we were just talking about the score and Ashman and Megan on the score, fantastic as always. Howard Ashman did not live to see this film premiere, which was horrible. He died of AIDS during this and actually a lot of his lyrics for a lot of these songs are tinged with that idea like the angry mob song it's a very personal film if you know his life mm-hmm. story i just okay. think about like the be our guest sequence which i re-watched recently when um angela lansbury died that was like my like little memorial moment animation and musically like it's so expansive it's so huge and i think like it's so thrilling to watch. Like when I look back at it, I think when when you're a kid, you're just like spectacle, good, you know, f- moving pictures, entertaining, right? But like as an adult, you look back at it, you're like, how did they do this? <laughs> it's wild. I mean, there's so much to it. And then I, I also love the sort of like cabaret styling of it, which is just really fun. I think I think it does what Under the Sea wanted to do in mm. Little Mermaid. The biggest thing about this movie at the time that it came out was that it was writing the coattails of Little Mermaid into 
this heyday of Disney revolution that was happening in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And they were taking not just the money, but also the skills they had developed from that style of animation and advanced it even further in just these, what, two years between the two movies. So even even the advertising, I was nine years old when this came out, and I, I remember how much they were talking about this revolutionary style of animation using computers and how they were like, they would show video clips of how they used live action to capture some of that and put it into digital for the movie, like the swishing of the beast's cape and things like that. So they were really, really going strong into this new, these new levels of animation in addition to this incredible score. And then, you know, again, the cast. Yeah, Angela Lansbury, man. Yeah. Legend. Iconic. <laughs> I will say though, that I personally, even at the time, but especially now, I don't think the computer graphics hold up in this only because they look too different from the hand-drawn parts. Mm. And I always have a problem with this. If it's obvious that it's animated in two or more different ways, I that sort of takes me out of the experience. Though they were able to do more with the computer graphics than they would have been just hand animating, or it would have taken them way longer and it would have been way more expensive to hand animate mm. it all. I wish they had planned around only hand animating. Mm -hmm. Or only computer graphics but there were they weren't there yet either yeah to me like the best example of what michael's talking about and the best of what molly are talking about are like there are two specific moments in my brain when i play this movie back in my head to me one of the worst moments and most jarring is that big sweeping angle when they're dancing to the mm -hmm. title song the characters look beautiful but the backdrop looks like a like you know, an early 90s screenshot. One of the best moments for me, actually, is one that I don't hear as many people talking about. It's near the beginning when Belle goes, I want adventure in the great white somewhere. And um, like the field around her, the way the wind yes. is blowing the grass. Yes. Just feels so like juicy to me. I, I love that moment. Yeah. That was like one of my like childhood, like fantasy cosplay moments when I was like five running around in the countryside. But I will say, Ramin, those two moments that you mentioned were the first time those kinds of camera angles were even possible in animation. Like the fact that it came sweeping in over the ballroom like that mm -hmm. would have been really, really difficult to do. Otherwise, it probably would have been really difficult to do in hand hand motion animation. So it's 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 kind of a give and take. Probably not difficult to hand animate. It would have just taken a way, way, way too much time because you would have to redraw the background every time. Mm -hmm. And usually in hand animation, you draw the background once. Yeah. And then the animated figures move on the background, or you like pan yeah, across on, like, the background. Yeah, way. yeah. But mm -hmm. it, so to have any kind of like sweeping like that, you would have to redraw the background for every frame, and it would have been doable, but it would have been incredibly expensive and time consuming. Yeah, it is interesting because I don't think I ever thought about this until now, like this very conversation that like you didn't see moving camera shots in animated movies before then it was like you had a scene and like and you would either cut to a different scene or but like it was really just like straight on right yeah. that is so interesting to think about and of course we were already talking about angela lansbury but let's not forget jerry orbach as yeah. lumiere so also good. fantastic yeah i mean like all the voice acting yeah. right can we talk about the opening sequence which we didn't talk about at all like when it comes in and then it's you know the Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Like that is so fun to me and it feels so Broadway. And I think we talked about this a little bit with The Little Mermaid, but like M Mankin and Ashman taking this Broadway musical style and putting it into um, these animated movies and really formatting them like a Broadway musical. So you have this scene, this huge scene setting thing with literally every single person in the town is a character right who is introducing themselves um i i love that and i'm not i'm not like a broadway kid but like that is kind of always my favorite part of every broadway show still like a twitter meme of i need six eggs yeah. <laughs> yeah. i saw something the other day that said something like the reason that price of eggs is so inflated is because gaston is with his like number of eggs he eats he's driving up the price <laughs> of eggs <laughs> poor mother is suffering because of it <laughs> it's a lot of eggs is all i'm saying it, it is a lot of eggs <laughs> but if you want to be roughly the size of a barge 
Yes. Uh, do you guys have anything to say about this iconic classic? I think, I think oh, the only thing that I have on my list is Christina Applegate. Christina and I, love her. Applegate. I do love her. Yes. Stars as the oldest teenage daughter um, of a family who, like, the mother goes away on like vacation with like her new boyfriend or whatever and leaves the kids and the teenage daughter is thinking yes i'm gonna have a, like a summer of freedom without parental sort of assholery and then the mom actually surprises her by like putting this like sweet little old lady who's gonna be their babysitter but then this as soon as the mom's gone like she turns she starts cracking the whip but like then she like dies in her sleep they hide the body they like deliver it to a funeral home like weirdly and like with like this like little note that's like here's an old lady like sorry <laughs> like, and, um, and then they're like right like they're like it's like freedom but then like the Christina Applegate character is like oh right like we need money and so she starts like she gets this job and starts working and it's kind of I think it's interesting as a movie about like being this teenager who's realizing what it means to be an adult and provider for a family because it starts out as all fun and games but then it's like oh shit like we have to clean. We have to uh, eat healthy food and not get sick and like all of this stuff. And um, I think it's just really interesting to watch that journey, but like, it's a camp classic. Like the movie is hilarious. And I think it was critically panned when it came out, but has become sort of this cult favorite. There is a fashion show in the movie. Of course there is. <laughs> it's, a, it's a 90s teen <laughs> film. <laughs> This is interesting because this is a movie that like we were talking earlier about comfort, like comfort movies. And this is a movie that I think is one of my comfort movies. Uh, you know, the young daughter who is getting married and then like her dad is like my little girl's all growing up. This movie about this daughter's like life, like huge life event that is so important to her. And it's all told from the dad's point of view. <laughs> And it's really all about him um, and his struggles with like letting go and like his daughter growing up and like how she wants this big extravagant wedding. They bring in this wedding planner and that's the Martin Short character, Frank. It is a really sweet movie because like in the end, it's all about like the dad's relationship with his daughter and how much they love each other. And it also has Diane Keaton in it. I was going to say, don't forget Diane Keaton. <laughs> <laughs> It also has Diane Keaton doing extremely Diane Keaton things. I only saw it recently for the first time. We were surprised that it was as well, as lesbian as it was. <laughs> it's very lesbian. I read the book also and have seen the movie. It's a classic domestic abuse lesbian situation in the South, in the deep South. <laughs> Kathy Bates is playing sort of against her type and doesn't give my favorite performance of her career. This movie has Mary Louise Parker, and I love Mary Louise Parker so much. Yes. So I will <laughs> tell you guys, I feel like I've been saying this a lot lately, but I was a little traumatized by this movie. Because, you know, when things came out into, onto VHS, it was a big deal. So my parents rented this, and I was must have been, what, 10, I think, when I saw this for the first five minutes. And all I saw was the scene with, you know, spoiler alert, where he gets hit by the train. And I'm like, oh, I'm, yeah. I can't watch this. And I've never seen it all the way mm. through. Mm. you should that is a small part of the movie yeah it's a, that's a, actually a very small part of the movie that, that's really only there because it's the reason that these two women come together i get um, it i do just like i know the quicksand is important and never ending story i get it you know to your point about kathy bates i think she kind of did the best she could with what she was given which was like you know very sort of the b to the a characters um but I, I love this movie. I, I also think it's worth noting that there are some interesting and at times problematic like racial relationships mm -hmm. and tensions. But I think it kind of did the best it could for the period of time that it's the narrative is about. Hello, where are you? <gasps> Hi. Hi, Bobby. Hello. I watched Hook on my wedding night. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, no, I love this movie. I saw it um, in the theater as a child and it's obviously a classic and it, it um, is a movie that 
yeah, I guess you could say is, is a comfort movie. And so uh, when I got married, you know, we left the big sort of wedding thing. And then we went to this hotel. We had a f- early morning flight the next morning. Uh, so we were like at the hotel by the airport. We had a suite. It was really nice. We got there. And then we do, you know, like what people do on their wedding night. And then, um, and then like most guys, my husband fell asleep immediately. And then I was it just in this hotel suite (laughs) like really excited about going on a honeymoon trip the next morning but like and then like I just got married and like oh okay and he's just asleep well it was a suite so I could close the bedroom door and go into the living room and I turned on the tv and I started flipping through the channels and hook was on and it was like pretty near the beginning of the movie it wasn't exactly at the beginning but I was like, well, okay, I'll put this on until I start to feel sleepy. And I watched the whole movie. <laughs> well, what a cast in this. In this. So, of course, yeah. directed by Steven Spielberg. But, of course, Robin Williams, Dustin Hoffman, Julia Roberts, Bob Hoskins, oh, Maggie Julia Smith. Julia Roberts as and, Tinkerbell. And Glenn Close in a very brief cameo. Did any of the Lost Boys grow up to be, like, important actors? I feel like the one who played Rufio. Rufio. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, no, Glenn Close plays the pirate at the toward the beginning who gets put into the boo box. Yes. She's in drag. Also, I really love Maggie Smith as yes. Wendy. Mm-hmm. Yes. A really good touch. Because yeah. they touch they touch on the idea of Wendy's gotten older in the original play. They didn't show it in the Disney movie, but a lot of the different iterations do. And I, I always thought that would be really cool to look into how much she's like her mother. And now she's a great grandmother. And of course, it's Maggie Smith, so it's a flawless performance. Do we want to touch on how Maggie Smith has been playing like the same age of person for like 30 years? <laughs> I mean, if you've got it, flaunt it. <laughs> I think it's one of those movies that the cast really makes it what it is. Like, I I wonder if the same script would have fared as well with, you know, a, a more middling cast. Also, I don't even know how much we've talked about Robin Williams in this movie because he's so amazing in this movie. Like, I feel like this movie showcases all the things he could do within one role you know like he he, there are moments when he's silly and funny there are moments when he's serious and sad and it's just like oh he's even got a lot of action in this movie he didn't play action roles Mm. but he does a lot can we talk about the magic of the food fight scene yes i love that scene so much Uh, we haven't really talked about dustin hoffman as hook which is really like one of the great dustin hoffman roles yeah the kid who played thud the heavy kid in the kind of Boy Scout outfit. Yeah. It's just, I knew, I related to him on a very deep level from a very young age as a fellow fat kid. Yeah. But you can see yourself in every single one of those Lost Boys and in the two that played Peter Banning's kids. Those were, those two mm-hmm. were amazing, especially Jack. They were just fantastic. I don't know how Spielberg finds these kids. I have seen all of My Girl. I don't remember a lot of it, but I remember being traumatized by the ending. <laughs> I haven't seen all of it, but I just remember that Macaulay Culkin dies from a bee sting. Yeah, from many bee stings. Oh, <laughs> is it many? Yeah, it's many bee stings. Spoiler um, alert. Dan Aykroyd, Jamie Lee Curtis, Macaulay Culkin, and Anna Chlumsky, I think is how you yeah. pronounce her name. That was yeah. her first movie. Yeah. I, I want to know like what is in the head of the casting director who like looks at this like heartfelt <laughs> coming-of-age story and goes... Get me the kid from home alone. (laughs) I guess he proved that he has some range. Or did he? Although I think he deliberately stepped away from acting. Like, like he didn't want to continue with it. But like, uh, you do sort of go like, okay, what other movies was he in? Home Alone, (laughs) My Girl, that one thriller where he's like an evil kid. Do any of you remember that movie version of the Nutcracker that came out with him in it? It's it's Macaulay Culkin in The Page Master, isn't it? I love this movie. Um, it is just so emblematic of like the struggle to be a queer person of color in the 80s, of like the queer struggle in general. Like my favorite thing about this documentary is how like rough around the edges it is. Not only does it not hold any of the like difficult facts of their lives back, but it also just like even the most beautiful characters have this kind of 
crafted quality like a you know like a i want to say homemade but i feel like that has uncomfortable implications here but you know what i'm trying to say right like there's handmade handmade yes that's probably a better way of saying it like but i just love that about it it feels so authentic like even the characters who are the most beautiful have those kind of like their seams showing Mm -hmm. and you feel by the end of this movie like you know all these people and just watching the things they could do with having so little it's such a beautiful documentary like it it could be a documentary about anything and it would be beautiful but it's about this very specific subculture right that is existing sort of on the margins of society in the middle of like this huge city like you said you get to know each of these individual people and their struggles and their joys also and I think that that's what makes it so great is that it really is full of joy even when it has so much darkness (laughs) in it right like I mean because like this is when like they're at the height of the AIDS crisis you know several of the characters die before they finish filming the movie or or shortly after it humanizes them so much I don't know that necessarily you know suburban moms were watching Paris is burning but like for people who would not have known people like this I'm very close to the microphone right now (laughs) We heard you guys like elbows. This is starring Kevin Costner, Morgan Freeman, Christian Slater, and Alan Rickman. Christian Slater is so hot in this movie (laughs) as Will Scarlet. Oh man, smoking hot Christian Slater. I loved, loved, loved this movie. I have a very early image of some of the advertising they did when like they would put images on food boxes like boxes of macaroni and cheese and stuff it was that kind of thing that was all over the stores i've seen a lot of interviews about this from this time and everybody's talking about kevin costner this kevin costner that it's like who cares kevin costner was not the right pick for robin hood he did he did well in this movie as this character but this was not robin hood for him this was just kevin costner being being a hero that said He did a great job. Everybody else gave like lifetime level performances. Alan Rickman was fantastic as he always is. Kevin Costner doesn't even attempt an English accent in in Uh, the movie, does he? Well, apparently he did on set and they were like, you know, just "Ah." use your regular voice. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's the story that, because they were like, just be yourself, just be yourself. They were really trying to get him to lose the he's, he's the all-american robin hood <laughs> yeah i actually haven't seen this but the thing that i really hate from it is that brian adams song everything i do is that from this movie uh, do it for yeah. you. was that their God. best original song God, I, <laughs> yeah and i fucking hate that song and the mom rock stations in ohio played it constantly they probably still do yeah but you know if you think about his aesthetic and compare it to the aesthetic of this movie when you like even just google i've never seen this movie but even just googling the photos of the male actors in this movie i'm like oh okay yeah i will say the music video was actually quite good if you can set aside the song the video was well done because it used scenes from this movie that's another thing i want them to bring back is like the song from the movie with a music video that has scenes from the movie (laughs) okay now erica talked about her trauma this movie really messed me up like I'm not sure that I'm not still recovering from it (laughs) I watched it in college when a bunch of my friends were watching it and I said I don't like scary movies I don't I especially don't like scary movies where the scary thing is a person who just hurts other people and um and they said you know oh come on we're all gonna watch it and I was like well I guess it's like an important classic movie and I should watch it no (laughs) fatal mistake (laughs) terrible It's such a shame that this movie has such a vitriolically transphobic character in it. Yeah. Um, Or depiction, I guess I should. Yeah, both, right? All all of the above. It's so unfortunate because it really is one of Jodie Foster's best performances Mm -hmm. and Anthony Hopkins too, really. Like, I mean, I'm also not a fan of scary movies, but I can get through this when I've seen it because like it's, their their acting is just so good uh like you are rooting for her so hard the whole time 
Ninja, ninja, rap. I watched this movie a few times. This was one of the videos in my grandma's basement. And I just remember a lot of like really cool ninja fight scenes. Ninja Turtles 2 does, did not do as well as the first one, but it was so it was so well lined up with the story from from the original. I thought it was I thought it was good as far as sequels goes. I'm not going to say it was a good standalone movie, but it was so much fun. It was great fan service to people who love Ninja Turtles in general or people who loved the first Ninja Turtles movie. The story was a stretch, but then, you know, so is any movie with four guys running around in rubber costumes. I thought that Shredder was so scary in this movie. Yeah, he was he was a lot scarier in this one because, you know, he basically come back from the dead. And I, even when I was young, I was like, really? He just survived? It seemed like sort of an odd plot development, but whatever. He was very scary and, and very good in this movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Delma and Louise is a movie directed by Ridley Scott about Susan Sarandon and Gina Davis leaving their boring lives and their abusive husbands and going for a life of crime instead <laughs> they kill a few people they put a cop in a, the trunk of his own car which is just incredibly badass and then they drive off the rim of the grand canyon it's a great sort of feminist revenge fantasy i love this movie <laughs> oh and a young brad pitt a young smoking hot brad pitt whatever happened to gina davis because i feel like i haven't seen a movie with gina davis in like 20 years i think she intentionally stepped away from acting she was doing some kind of like philanthropic work or something in 2000 Four, she founded the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media, which yeah, works right. collaboratively with the entertainment industry to increase the presence of female characters in media. I don't have a segue, but let's go, <laughs> let's go into some games. All right, so here we are. We're going to start with the 1992 Oscars movies from 91. Order this time. We'll start with Ramin, then Molly, then Erica, since Erica won the last TV one. Yeah, Erica always seems to win, actually. <laughs> so, Ramin, which of these five won Best Actor? I'm trying to remember The Fisher King. I don't think I ever saw it. Definitely didn't see Prince of Tides. Torn between two, but I'm going to go with my preference. Anthony Hopkins. That's it? Yay! Molly, who won Best Supporting Actor from these five? Oh, interesting. You gave me a hard one. It was not really a contentious, <laughs> contentious one that year. Um, I guess my best bet would be Tommy Lee Jones in JFK. Nope, to Erica. Oh, how dare you. Uh, Harvey Keitel. Nope, back to Ramin. I, just because it's third on the list, Ben Kingsley, because I've never <laughs> seen these movies. No, nope, back to Molly. <laughs> I'm gonna go with Jack Palance for City Slickers. That's right. To Erica, who won Best Actress that year? Jodie Foster. Yes. To Ramin, who won Best Supporting Actress? The only one I've seen of these is the one I'll guess, Jessica Tandy. Nope, to Molly. I'm gonna cast my lots with Juliette Lewis. Nope, to Erica. <laughs> well, what? Mercedes Rule in The Fisher King? Yes. To Ramin, what won Best Original Song? Damn it, I was gonna just guess the Beauty and the Beast one, but it's three. Yeah, that actually does make it hard. Yeah. <laughs> if it's I do it for you, I'm gonna be pissed. That's not a guess, no. but if it is. I mean, you know it's not. Guess one of the Beauty and the Beast ones. <laughs> um, I Fingers think it was assist. Beauty and the Beast, right? The title song, I think. Title song? Correct. To Molly, what one best picture? Is it Beauty and the Beast or is it Silence of the Lambs? I think it's Beauty and the Beast. Nope, to Erica. <laughs> gotta be silence of the lambs then yes yeah we would have heard of the others if we had <laughs> if they were oscar winners yeah so erica is in a slight lead after our first game uh <laughs> we are now going to highest grossing films of 1991 i don't know if it's number one but teenage mutant ninja turtles has to be on the list somewhere does not really to molly beauty and the beast beauty and the beast it's number three, Molly gets eight points. To Erica. <sighs> Father of the Bride. That's a no. Now to remain. Terminator 2. T2. It's one. Is one. Dang it. <laughs> I, I was going to guess that for the first one. I wasn't. couldn't decide between that and Beauty and the Beast. You've been terminated. 
It's gonna have to be uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Molly gets nine points for that. Yes. Molly takes the lead, y'all. <laughs> Back to Erica. Adam's family. Eight. Oh. Erica gets three points. Woo-hoo. Back to Ramin. Hook. Hook was number four. Oh, man. Yay. Okay, Thelma and Louise. Thelma and Louise was not one. <sighs> Erica. Silence of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs. Is that number five? Number five. Back to Ramin. Oh, now it's tougher. I'm just guessing my girl. That's a no. Second mistake for Ramin. The Naked Gun, two and a half. Cheap to make, easy to go watch over and over again while getting high. That was number seven. Yes! Back to Erica. Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead? Unfortunately, not one of the correct answers. Hmm. For me. I think I'm about to make my next mistake, but I'm going with the theory that family movies sell big. Five old goes west. Unfortunately, not this one. Ramin is wow. out for this round. I think it's Hot Shots. Hot Shots is number 10. Molly gets a point. Erica. I bet it's JFK. JFK was number six. Erica gets five points. Back to Molly. Cape Fear. Cape Fear is number nine. Molly gets those two points. Yes! Ah! Molly, we're tied. <laughs> Erica and Molly are tied with 29 points. Last game. But I'm only two points behind. Okay, so now we are doing Metacritic. So this is the first year that Metacritic comes into the story here. This takes all critics' reviews that that were around at the time and aggregates them. We are starting with Erica. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. That is a no. Erica's first mistake. Two remain. I think it goes well with a good Chianti. The Silence of the Mother-Loving Lambs. Silence of the Lambs. It's number four. Ramin gets seven points. To Molly. Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast is number one. Molly gets five points. Does the title song play in anyone else's head every single time someone every says? Single... Oh, yeah. And, and only in Angela Lansbury's voice. To Erica. Thelma and Louise. Thelma and Louise. Fucking classic. It better be on the list. Number two. Yeah! Nine points. We love a feminist revenge fantasy. To Ramin. Hmm, I'm trying to remember if Hook was, like, universally loved or hated by critics. It's a Spielberg movie. I should stop helping you. (laughs) I'm actually, I'm going to go with, uh, I like how I'm saying I'm going to go with, as though I'm any more certain what I'm actually going to go with. (laughs) Fried Green Tomatoes. Fried Green Tomatoes was not on the list. Now it's Molly. Hook. Hook. I'm going to make Ramin eat his (laughs) feet or whatever. Are you, though? Oh, is it not on list? Nope. Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> to Erica. Um, Cape Fear. Cape Fear is also not on the list. Oh, I know what my next guess is. I'm gonna guess My Girl. My Girl is not on the list. Ramin's second mistake in this round. Yeah. Back to Molly. Terminator 2. Terminator 2, not on this list. Molly's not on the Oh my god. Erica. Adam's Family? Adam's Family. It's not on this list. Erica is out in this round. Remain. If this ends up being my last guess, I want to be that person who guessed woman's heart. Paris is burning. Paris is burning. I bet it's on the list. It's number seven. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I'm not good for the art house movies. Was Life is Sweet the one that you said was like got d- directed by a black woman about Gullah people? No. Which no. one was that? Daughters of the Dust. Is that on the list? No. That was okay. Daughters, Daughters of the Dust. Dust. Why am I helping Yeah, you? I want to put Daughters of the Dust on there. That was number eight. Yes! <laughs> Three points for Molly. Back to Ramin. I paid attention in class. Like, something in me is telling me to guess JFK, but it seems like that movie actually wasn't good. So, I'm also sort of leaning toward Double Life of Veronique, because that sounded really interesting. I'm just going to give Molly all my answer ideas before I, <laughs> before I get out. Um... JFK. I'm just going to go with JFK. JFK was not on the list. Ramin's out in this round. You know what, though? I think Ramin has a point because Michael does this thing where he puts things on the things even though we don't have anything to say about them because they play into the game. So I'm going to say The Double Life of Veronique. The Double Life of Veronique. That was number five. Six points for Molly. Get to go again. The only one still in the game, baby. I've started to figure this shit out. Um, so the won. other one 
that you talked about that nobody else had anything to say that you included on the list is life is sweet so i'm gonna say that one life is sweet number three eight points oh, from i'm LA. gonna win the game for the first time ever so now what i'm gonna say and this is weird but i think i feel it in my stomach is father of the bride father of the bride he is not on the list molly is out oh. Okay, so number 10 was A Better Tomorrow. Number nine was, oops, I forgot to put it on the list. <laughs> My God! None of you could have gotten those two points. Sorry. Um, and then number six was Homicide. Any observations that anyone wants to make about Oscars grossing or what the critics like? I just feel like a lot of these are kind of forgettable. If we look at the Oscars list, yeah, other than Silence of the Lambs and Beauty and the Beast, The Fisher King, City Slickers, you'll hear people talk about City Slickers sometime, mm -hmm. but I've never heard of The Fisher King. And that had Robin Williams in it. Oh yeah, we forgot Hook came out in 1991, but it didn't get any critical love or Oscar I'm love. I'm shocked that it doesn't have critical love because I seem to remember it being like a really popular I mean I guess popular and critical is, is not the same thing but I remember it being like one of the great Spielberg movies of yeah. the 90s right like those Spielberg family movies that sort of came out yeah. in the late 80s and early 90s it grossed very well all right well I think that's it so thank you everyone for watching thank you everyone for joining me in this to this side <laughs> of Erica is going to be another video that YouTube thinks you might like up there is going to be the link to follow our channel. Subscribe to our channel. That's what it's called. Subscribe. Um, give this video a like if you liked it. Give it a pity like if you didn't like it. Um, let us know what we're missing uh, or anything else that, you know, struck stuck out to you. What are your thoughts about these films or others from 1991? Take on your keyboard. <laughs> and uh, yeah, maintain your groovy selves. Well, in that case, let's move on to Homicide.